Welcome, welcome, everybody. Uh, I am Ghost Kumo, and we have a uh, special little show for y'all today. Um, welcome back to the uh, RPG Limit Breaks podcast. For those of you on Twitch, those of you watching on YouTube or watching on the YouTube VOD, uh, this is just kind of our you know talk show with um, very special guests that we invite on to talk about a variety of different RPGs, RPG speedruns, RPG projects, and stuff like that. Um, so with me today, uh, we have Alec K47. Hello, I'm not the main guest, but I'm here because I know Mass Effect. Um, I'll be on the couch for Sanjan's run uh, at Limit Break coming up quite soon. And uh, I'm always happy to talk about games I love, like Mass Effect 2, which is going to be the main focus today. Yeah, and we have our uh, special guest. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, hello, I'm Sanjan. You might have seen me... Uh play classic jrpg well jrpgs like off the path i've done final fantasy and but some of you have also seen my other side i do like to do western rpgs especially bioware rpgs right on right on so um as alec was alluding to um so just really quick, uh, I mean, the title of the stream is Talking Mass Effect. Um, the main reason we do that is a lot of our guests that we like to invite are, you know, people who have runs in our event. And in this particular case, we have the uh, Mass Effect No One Left Behind um, incentive category. Um, I believe it was accepted as like any percent with No One Left Behind as the like incentive. Yes. Um, but that's yeah. going to be. Sorry, but that's go gonna on. be on. <laughs> that's all good. Uh, that's gonna be on the uh, first day of the event, which um, I don't think it's on their thing showing up here. But that's gonna be uh, this coming um, May, uh, so less than a month away. Our start time for the event is May nineteenth, uh, and it'll be running until the twenty fifth. Are raising money for the fantastic cause of NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Uh, the event starts uh, once again at um, noon in Mountain Standard Time, which is because we're going to be hosting it in Salt Lake City, and going to be running until about mid uh, about 10 p.m. Uh, currently is what our scheduled time is on the 25th that Saturday. Yeah, hopefully not 5 a.m. <laughs> Even yes. sorry for those of you who might want <laughs> us to go that long. We did that once. That was uh, that was an adventure. Um, but in any case, um, yeah, so the uh, Mass Effect series, I believe predominantly we've been talking mainly about Japanese RPGs over the years. And we're going to be talking about probably a decent variety of stuff because, you know, you run so many different kinds of games, uh, Sanjan. But um, since that is the focus for the, at least the start, um, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, kind of, I guess, the de facto question that we ask is, uh, what is it about this series that uh, drew you to drew you to want to run it? So, games I tend to speedrun, I I tend to I wanted to like speedrun games that I really liked, and I've always been like a big Bioware fan. Like, I had started out actually started out uh, learning Knights of the Old Republic, so I learned one and two, and then I moved on to Mass Effect one. But also because I kind of like, as for like a challenge to myself, I wanted to learn something that wasn't a traditional like turn based RPG. So it, even though Kodor is like, you know, st st it's like a real time, sort of real time uh, RPG, you could still play it like very turn based. But I wanted to learn like something that was completely out of my personal scope, personal like range of skills and I thought I felt that Mass Effect was the best choice for me because it was a shooter which ironically enough I am very bad at shooters yeah kind of one of the things that I had always seen is like interesting because we didn't actually have a large presence of Mass Effect on the Limit Break channel for years and I think part of you know what made it a little weird for the channel was the fact that much of the role playing elements come from the, you know, playing the game casually and just like seeing all the different dialogue choices and doing, you know, all the different missions differently. Like there is a progression system very much like an RPG, but it, since like 
you know, the mid 2000s. Almost every game has some amount of RPG progression systems. You look at something like God of War and it's sort of skill trees and skill points. Um, you look at Devil May Cry as like a little bits and pieces of it here and there. Um, so Mass Effect is like the most shootery of the games that we have uh, on you know the schedule. And I guess um, that's kind of case in point to one thing that people might not necessarily associate with us, but we do try to do as an event is not just have pure RPGs, but games that are at least very much part of the oeuvre. And so even if you don't personally consider Mass Effect 2 to be an RPG, it's RPG enough for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, on top of that, it's like, yeah, the first game in the series definitely uh, leaned a little bit more heavily into the RPG elements and the second onward was a bit more in the shooter type, but it's, it's definitely a game that like, I think the role playing elements are what re people really got attached to. And that's kind of one of the big things for us on this channel. And in talking about like things that, uh, you know, things that, you know, caught people's attention. Like one of the things that I noticed, um, I don't remember what exactly was the first time we had mass effect on the channel, but, um, when I put on the RPG blitz marathon, we had mass effect in, um, I think you were in it for that one, Alec, this I was believe like so, 2019 yeah. and is that, that or I... one of the questing for glories where it was his first appearance on this channel? Yeah, and the thing that I noticed about it most of all was just seeing all the people coming into chat and just like, you know, waxing poetic on their nostalgia for these games. Um, just, you know, their various different experiences playing it, how they responded to, you know, different stuff. Um, and favorite characters, favorite too. Characters like, that's like that's always a big point of discussion <laughs> and characters that a lot of people don't like, but... For example, mm -hmm. Ashley Williams, like a lot of people don't like her because she rubs a lot of people wrong in the first game and kind of in the second game in her brief appearance. But then if you play the third game, like she can have a full going Paragon arc through the three games. And I think that's really cool. So mm -hmm. like we, there are other things that we can talk about with game three and um, just getting the elephant in the room. No, I do not like the ending to that game, but it's there's so much good in that game that I still mostly remember it fondly. I think mm -hmm. it's because, like, especially Mass Effect is a series of games. You're you're really invested and in, like immersed in the world. Like you're role playing as as this battle hardened soldier, and then like you feel like you're you feel like you're making like meaningful. I should say mostly meaningful decisions and like you get to influence the state of the world and also like you can you kind of grow attached to like your companions as well mm -hmm. yeah and that actually i think ties a little bit into the category that's going to be you know um the incentive for this one um I do have that right, right? That we're doing the it's the um, it's any percent with uh, no one left behind as the um, as like a bonus incentive. Yes, that's I correct. Mean, yeah, I would have it wrong too. So, yeah, and yeah. one of the cool things about that is like even though it's right at the beginning of the marathon, because the routes are so similar for so long, you can actually say, okay, now I'm just going to do these extra few things to set up no one left behind and you're good mm -hmm. because yeah. there's a lot that goes into uh you know like how you do or don't lose characters on the final mission and one of the big things that we've done is like we've got a reliable route that takes the absolute bare minimum of effort but gets no one killed yeah, and I remember that being kind of like a huge personal thing for people with that game was just, you know, how consequential this choice was. Like, in a, in the grand scheme of things, it is not one of the longer incentives that we've had to the marathon, but like relative, I think, to what like the category means to people between like the any percent and this, it's quite significant in terms of just like what the difference is for people on their casual playthroughs, for example. 
I think that's kind of just an interesting thing. And like you touched on this a little bit as well, but I think like kind of one of the aspects of this series that make it a little different from most JRPGs is that you have, or most JRPGs, most most RPGs in general, is that you have this series of games that is like all kind of interconnected. I know people tend to like have a favorite of the bunch because they play fairly differently, but in general, people tend to think of the series as like one big uh, entity. And though we are speed running them separately, um, it is kind of one of those interesting things because, you know, instead of people talking, you know, specifically about one game, they just kind of talk about their love for the series in general. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so I guess when <laughs> speaking of favorites there, I do have kind of the question there. Do you have like a favorite of the, uh, of the two that you run uh, San Jen out of curiosity? And if so, uh, which one? <laughs> Uh, I would say, like, speed run wise, a two is definitely my favorite just because it's extremely fast paced. But I think overall story, I think I have to hand it to one because I think one, while it does have its flaws, like, it really does give you that feeling that you're very immersed in the environment. And, like, when I play that game, especially, like, I go through the range of moods, and then it's like, especially the ending to one, it feels like really epic and that you've accomplished something big mm-hmm. I think for me um, I don't actually run to but I've definitely played around with a lot of the strats um, and I've been following the run since oh god like I think the first speed run verification of a Mass Effect 2 run I did was in like 2012 or 2013 for SDA so dating myself a little bit there, but uh, the run has come a long way since then. And mass, but for me, like I just love the pacing of the Mass Effect One run because there are times that you can just collect your breath. Like, okay, next up is the Thorian fight. All right, mentally prepare myself for it, get into it, and then once that, you know mammoth two minute concentration fest is done often uh you know having to worry about potentially dying as well then you get a nice little short break to catch your breath and then you get into other stuff um whereas mass effect 2 is pretty much go 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 or should i say go 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 (laughs) and uh but uh overall casually 2 is the game that I prefer not by huge amounts in either case, but I just love some of the characterization and the writing of Mass Effect 2 and how it takes kind of something that could be considered almost grimdark or too edgy and makes it not at all oppressive or off putting. Just it makes it feel natural. And I think that's a big accomplishment because so many games have failed at that. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. yeah, I've always liked the like. Ironically enough, I like as a speedrun. I prefer Mass Effect Two because, like, I I do a lot of the JRPGs that I play. Like, there's a lot of like really chill segments that like in Octopath where I just like hold B and I chill and skip cutscenes. But it's all it's refreshing for me to have like a nice change of pace where I play a game where I'm unironically like go go go. Yeah, it's just like I'm always on my feet. uh And I guess for me, I have Sonic games to give me the always on the go kind of thing. So, yeah, I have that as part of my portfolio as well. So Mass Effect, I guess, would be my change of pace to, you know, have something where I'm not constantly worrying about something. Mm hmm. Yeah, that was one of the things I saw with the run as well. Is I, I like the way that the first game was compartmentalized, and then I look at like the second one is like what is this like a half an hour shorter on average, not a little bit more. Definitely a shorter run. Um, so kind of something to kind of ask about that. Um, what would you say is like your favorite you know speed run strat or speed run tech that you have in? I guess maybe we could say both both games since you've run both of them for us, uh, Sanjian. I think my favorite tech, like, just for the flair, like, just because it's hilarious and I like it as a really funny party trick, is the Mako uh, trick in, uh, in ME1, where, like, y- you get 
you get a squad mate killed and you enter the Mako or Mako. I know you Final Fantasy VII fans are out there at the right time, and then the <laughs> the Mako just does really Mako things. It's it, it, it used to be like part of the speedrun for a bit, but then like we deemed it to be like far too inconsistent for our liking, which very fair. I I, I would agree with that, and yeah, and we pay, and but. Even then, it's just it's just the uh, the funniest party trick. But I think in the two, like there are some more recent strats developed, and I I think my favorite has to be one of the more recent tricks. Like it's difficult to execute, like especially where like you're in a speed run, and it's like if you, Mass Effect Two is a speed run where like if you fail the tr- like a trick, like your your run's likely likely over, as, if, mm. especially if you're trying to go for a PB pace. Like, it's pretty funny because in most JRPGs, like, I just roll my eyes whenever I'm down a minute, but in Mass Effect 2, I'm down, like, 10-15 seconds, and I'm already seeding a little bit. Mm-hmm. Your your fingers sliding closer to your reset key on the uh, on the live split. Yeah, pretty much, but for the Reaper, I, so there's this, like, map called, like, where you have to get the Reaper, uh, some kind of, like, tech thing called reaper iff and then identity friend foe yeah yeah and then there's so basically what you do is you kind of get onto this ledge and then you kind of like you do a trick and then you basically kind of like skip like 30 seconds and you basically like if you do it correctly you're instantly like on a second portion of that map but it's very hard it's actually like pretty hard to execute because you basically kind of like have to use the pause menu and pretty much time it so that you're in between the loading zones because if you're not in between the loading zones you you pretty much die and that's like 15 20 seconds gone but but basically like i really like that trick just because a it's a hard trick to execute especially like on a spot but b like it's just like a really cool like glitch that like when you really think about it, it's just like, wow! Like you can be pretty much just like manipulate the the pause menu to basically sand like sandwich yourself in between loading zones. Yeah, those kinds of tricks are always fun. Um, I've, so I've seen over the years that there's actually quite a variety of silliness in a lot of Bioware games, which I find mm-hmm. you know to be quite interesting. And my favorite from Mass Effect Two is one that is. Um, very likely to crash the game. Oh, no. <laughs> so there's this one place um, in, uh, I believe it's Samara's recruitment mission, where there are these uh, kind of explosive canisters with this kind of biotic increasing gas. Um, there's one part towards the beginning where you can get up on a ceiling via just some really odd combination of physics, but you have to essentially get exploded up onto the ceiling perfectly with the perfect arc and angle, or else you hit something in either soft lock or crash the game. And it's horrifically inconsistent. And I think it saves like 40 seconds or something like that if you get it. But if you miss it once, that time is basically gone. And if you mm-hmm. crash, it's definitely gone. I've done uh, I've done all loyalty missions, and I I, I had to say Samara's mission is the mission that definitely makes me the most scared because I've crashed there a few times. Which, yeah, crashes in Mass Effect Two are only like really concerning for the longer categories. Yeah, and I'd imagine like there are places you can find to quick save, but even then, yeah, it's not the most stable port. The uh, from what I can tell, the speedrun mod doesn't really affect that part of it much, if at all. But it's uh, it's kind of unfortunate because it's such a really awesome speed game and then there are things like that that can take you out of it but fortunately it's not that big of a deal in a marathon setting because it's inconsistent enough and rare enough that it works out fine 
Yeah, there's always like safety strats you can do. Like, I, when I was running all loyalty missions, like the biggest culprit of crashes for me would be Kasumi's loyalty mission, which I hate Kasumi's loyalty mission as a in, in a speedrun context. It's fun in a casual context, but in a speedrun, it's it's the it's the worst thing. Yeah, I c I can definitely understand that because it's such a compartmentalized mission and there are these different parts that um are pretty discreet. But um if you want a JRPG connection, I guess, uh Kasumi it has Japanese heritage. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, so you've actually you, you mentioned this. We briefly touched on this while we were in you know call before the stream. Uh, so what all does the uh, speedrun mod entail, if I may ask? So the speedrun mod uh, removes a. Uh, there's a couple quality of life things that you can do. It removes like all the the movie blocks that play, especially like when you're transitioning between planets. And then it removes mm. some cutscenes. It, it's a little bit imperfect, and like you'll you'll see during the speedrun, but like. The movie will still quote unquote play, even though like in the background, even though like the video won't show, and then you get to see these funny, these funny like close-ups of characters nice. and everything. <laughs> but it's mainly the there are there's also like yeah quality of life stuff such as like being able to quickly kind of like skip through kind of like a lot of the dialogue. Mm-hmm. How and, much time does this like save out of curiosity? Because quite a bit. Yeah, quite a bit of time. And in Ellie, it's even more. In Ellie, it's even more time. Yeah, I don't right. know exactly how much, but I remember that um, basic eighty percent runs were kind of in the hour fifty ish range. I think getting down to like an hour forty. 241 or something and granted this was with less tech and now obviously they're much faster so if <laughs> you want a comparison i'd say maybe look at the current world record and compare that to like maybe an hour 35 yeah hour i would 30, say hour 35 time like in there hour 30 hour 35 Dang, that's like almost a third of the run <laughs> yeah, yeah it's significant yeah there's a, like in original mass effect one there's no speed run mod so like Cutscenes there are probably like if you weren't doing cutscenes and Mass Effect One original, then it'd probably be like an hour, a little less or so. Yeah, something like that. It's un unfortunately just the way Mass Effect One is programmed. A mod doesn't work in the same way as it does for Mass Effect Two or for the Legendary editions. Just. The game breaks. Um, there were attempts made at it. Um, I remember Letters Words doing a stream on it, and it was like all these weird things were happening. <laughs> Stuff wasn't working right, and it's just like, is there any way to get this to work right? And uh, the conclusion we came to was probably not unless you like literally get deep into the game code. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I should say the the worst of it is like Mass Effect Three because there's a lot of on like mm -hmm. really long unskippable sequences. Like I know there was a mod developed for Legendary Edition Three, which I'll, I'll get into the differences between original and Legendary Edition. But I think in Three, like without with the speedrun mod, it was like an hour or a little more. I had to check. Let me see. It, it the the difference was the difference was like amazing just watch just seeing how uh how the how much the mod skips because i believe the mod skips like uh the classic uh good old pretty much there there's a lot of like really long cutscenes that you can't really skip like four to five minutes and then and then everything you can't i think it was like a yeah with the with the mod, it's like 130 ish, 120, Jeez, 130 ish, real and it's showing real time is like an hour 17 difference in the uh, in the category. Yeah, and then with cutscenes, it's like three hours because at the end of the M me three, generally, I think depending on how you time it, 
there's like a 20 minute final monologue with with something which we won't get into because that gets to the <laughs> ending and uh, it's bad RNG to talk about the ending mm. but <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so I should mention that for speedrunning purposes, there is the original versions of Mass Effect, and then there's the Legendary Edition, which the Legendary Edition was shipped in 2021. And because they use a newer version of the Unreal Engine, like a lot of the stuff that you could use in the original versions got fixed. So in one, like you can't basically do like the much faster versions of any of the tricks and you have to go through like for example on pharaohs like you have to generally like go to like go to a place where it takes like 10 minutes and and the original mass effect series like you basically skip that part yeah but you can boost through the lava <laughs> yeah that, yeah that that plan is actually shorter in me uh and the legendary edition one just because going through going through the lava pretty fast but if you touch the lava in the original mass effect one uh you're pretty much insta death, in, insta -death. Mm -hmm. yeah one of the things that's uh notable about ellie is that a lot of the clips don't work but not because they intentionally tried to fix them and i could tell because i spent hours trying to clip into the thorian fight like you do in the original version and um, I did not find a way, but all the collision was the same. You just couldn't get through walls the same, basically. Yeah, because I think when they updated uh, the Unreal Engine for the Mass Effect Legendary series, like that inadvertently fixed a lot of the tricks that speedrunners use in their original versions. Yeah, so so it, we don't hate on the devs for doing that because that was not their goal. They would have had to actively patch them back in, and that's something that, you know, a lot of indie devs will do, but it's never something you should expect. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, I own both uh, the original and the Legendary Edition, but I haven't speedrun Legendary Edition. I might speedrun just three just because I tried it in an original and I hate watching cutscenes, ironically enough. Like, uh, in some JRPGs, I don't mind watching cutscenes, but I, when, when it comes to Mass Effect, my mindset is basically I love glitches and I love going fast. Uh, ironically enough, like in most games, I prefer like glitchless speedruns. But for the map, like when it comes to like Mass Effect, they're like, any fast games like i highly prefer glitches yeah i think sense. i think uh mass effect 2 would be the best glitchless run of the entire trilogy though three wouldn't change all that much i don't think um but in one the unfortunate thing is just that you have to take so many more elevators um and then there is so much more to do on a couple specific planets um specifically um well i guess pharaohs would obviously be the big one because you can't clip into the thorian fight but like there's more stuff you have to do on Novaria. you actually have to do the um stuff at in the first area port hanchan so yeah, we skip it in Mass Effect 1 if you didn't see Sanjin's run for the last limit break. You also have to run around a lot more on the Citadel. Like oh, you'd, yeah. have, you'd, you'd have to recruit Garrus, which I think in, in, uh, in 1... Garrus and Rex. I don't think you have to recruit Rex. I think you can just say no outright to getting Rex, but you have to get either one of Garrus or Rex. I'm still slightly sad that the vote was to save the council instead of just yeet them. <laughs> <laughs> it's the shorter cutscene. Uh, you're saving the frames. You're doing a good deed and you're saving the frames. It's actually like 10 or maybe even a little more seconds faster. Yeah. This, this might be a bit of a silly question. I'm actually curious. Is there anything that like in the speed run would benefit from you carrying over from the first game? Uh, It's... So I think, so from one to two, no, but from 
two to three, yes, there'd be a lot of benefits because three, three takes more on from a two and one story stuff wise. But I believe in in Mass Effect three when you play the new game, like you're only allowed to use the or at least for the official the categories on the leaderboard, you're only allowed to use like the presets, like mm. the like the preset chosen default character world then. I should say the default character world's a little bleak, but Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's um, kinda one of those it is kinda one of those things that there's sometimes this novelty of. Although I know technically like most speedrun leaderboards, they just say you're forced to do a new game. Because like a lot of games they'll have like carryover bonuses from previous games in the series and speedrun leaderboards tend to not be like you need to buy this game in order to get like a two two to ten second advantage in the second one yeah it's not necessary because like there's always uh like you can like we do have preset saves to or to whichever world state it's all so i i forget actually there is only one effective thing but it's not for no one left behind or any percent it affects all loyalty missions so and yeah all loyalty missions is actually faster for he tap a world state where Rex is dead because if you like there, you have to do a grunt's loyalty mission on Tuchanka mm-hmm. and when you or and Morden's and when you meet Rex, you get this really long, pretty long, like six thir- 45 second unskippable cutscene where you're like, hey, you're you two are catching up, but you don't, but if Rex is dead, you don't have that. And um, going into things a little bit more, some of the things that you might think are beneficial are not necessarily that beneficial. So, like, coming in at a higher level in Mass Effect 2 is not a big deal because um, relative to your level, damage can actually be more in your favor at lower levels. And, for example, uh, when we do the new game plus in Mass Effect 2, there is a specific save file set up so that you come in at as low a level as possible um, while still being new game plus. And some of the other benefits, like the money and the extra resources, aren't terribly important because you can get the resources pretty quick. Like, there's specific planets that are planned out for any upgrades that you need to get those resources. And you wouldn't really get much anyway because the speed run in mass effect one does not get you to a terribly high level it does not get the rich achievement which is where the biggest uh material bonuses come from so it doesn't really add much to a mass effect 2 speed run assuming you're doing um assuming you're not doing the completion completionist categories which would change that equation a bit but a completionist trilogy run would be a thing. <laughs> that would be a long run. I think yeah. uh, with on Ellie, people have done or like. I think the total would be around like four to five ish, or well, four and a half ish hours, roughly, or to half to five ish for like. Because like you still have to like import your character, etc. And yeah, it's a. Uh, I think the biggest notice would be from two to three but from one to two it's not it's not too bad but also on the difficulty talk like i've also ran new game which is like you start from a new game which and it's it's pretty much noticeably a lot easier because you end that game at like yeah or you end mass effect 2 at like level i I forget the level but it's like in your mid 10s like 15 16 or something like that and the boss, like the boss, the boss pretty much gets like the final boss pretty much gets one hit. But like, for example, and no one left behind because you do missions that give you more XP, like or more XP and everything. I can't remember if it's more XP and everything, but you're at a higher level, so the bosses and all the enemies are like very noticeably tougher. But on the other hand, you get better weapons early. You have your best weapons early in New Game Plus, so like the strat. The strat pretty much uh, noticeably differs from new game to new game plus. Like in new game, you're, you actually use a shotgun for the first half of the speed run until you get the Madoc. And you don't have access to the obviously overpowered cane. <laughs> right. 
Right. So, um, kind of something to, I guess maybe let's shift gears a little bit. Um, so this is your third, um, RPG limit break. I believe that you're um, going to be running a game for us in. Yes, that's correct. Um, yeah. So we had you open on 2022, which, um, kind of a, uh, <laughs> it was, it was, a, it was actually pretty exciting to see the first, uh, Mass Effect, uh, submitted and then ran at that one because we'd, we'd had it like submitted a few times and then now you know finally getting in the event and you know being a success um, but we've also had you for um, kind of a variety of other games um, so what is it kind of that just draws you to like the various different kinds of games I know we've had you for um, uh, multiple Octopath runs and uh, well and Octopath and Octopath run I think we have you on the backups for this year um, and for uh, another category of Octo One, and then we had you for um, an incentive for Octopath Two uh, last year, and then we also had you on for Pokemon Omega Ruby. What is it? Just kind of the uh, that, like you know, just draws you to this, you know, I guess eclectic set of RPGs. Yeah, so like basically, I just tend to choose RPGs that I love playing because if I didn't like playing them, like at least half decent as a casual playthrough, then like. I would not really enjoy speedrunning them. So I should say the ex- main exception to that is Pokemon. <laughs> because I, I just pick whatever Pokemon spe- speedrun makes the most sense. But I'm also very picky about my Pokemon speedruns because Pokemon, like, ironically, like, they pretty much take up the most energy, like, even more than a Mass Effect speedrun. Honestly, because like it. Pokemon, <laughs> I completely like, believe that. especially like even like Manip or Manipless, like if I do, if I do, I've done Manip speedruns like Pokemon Black, and I am constantly stressed uh, about like losing my Manip. If I didn't worry about stats, I'm worried about Manip. And I've speed also speedrun Shield and of course Omega Rub- Ruby, and like. I care about this. Like, I have to like keep, constantly keep track of my stats. I have to be worried about what I need, if there's anything extra I need to get, or like, if like my HP. Like, I basically like have to do a lot of math in my head. Yeah, Pokemon speedruns have always been this kind of weird thing. Anytime I've watched, where it's like the actual routing has kind of a like a limit in like kind of the flow chart of decision making. But because there's just so many different things that can happen, so many different little, you know, things you have to watch out for and just so many ways things can go wrong. It just it feels like it's, you know, it's stress for things that are out of your control rather than like, can I pull this off or not? It's just like, am I going to get, you know, crit on this one fight that I, you know, it would be run over for? Yeah, I say it's very much like a different like each game has like their own different kind of stress. Like I know for Octopath, like. I can do a lot of things, like, especially, like, for two. Two is generally just, like, very consistent, and, like, like, the fights are extremely consistent, and, like, as long as you can, ex- like, press buttons, or and then things reasonably go right, like, you, like, you're pretty much golden. And in yeah, one, I- though, like, I think especially for Galdera, which is the backup category, a run I'm I have for this year like Galdera is a category where like I have to kind of like slightly think about like my decision like if I need if I need to get anything extra or like keep track of like what I have similar it's not as bad as Pokemon in my opinion but it's probably like the most similar to Pokemon mm-hmm yeah I dabbled in single story runs many years ago so I remember that game being real fun to like kind of, you know, work with the route and just absolutely just slice the game into pieces and just do all these kinds of things that it's like you can do and they're not really glitches, but, you know, it doesn't feel like they're intended. Like you go to this late game area, you grab a few things and then you you warp out before the encounter rate would kill you. But there's always like that stress of like, oh, if I get an encounter on this screen, I die or um, certain bosses that are just like, if, if they do any of these particular things, it's like, well, runs over, got to click reset. Yeah, <laughs> like 
that or uh, like Mass Effect Two from like, Mass Effect One and Two is just very much. Uh, well, Mass Effect One I would say is a lot more RNG than Two. Uh, noticeably mm-hmm. more RNG than Two because Two is very much. Uh, you do the trick or you lose time. Like you play, you play, you execute, and you save time. Like there's like at the very high ends, there is some RNG aspect to it, but it's like not as noticeable. So what you're saying is if you get a bad run, it's a skill issue. A lot of times, yes, which I, I will freely admit I sometimes have like skill issues and in, into <laughs> but that game is like it's a it's high stress, but it's like a different kind of high stress, I would say. Mm-hmm. Like I, I was just like, hey, like I gotta focus, like I gotta I know I gotta then like do these things right and react accordingly to like what I know should happen. And I, and I would say, like, well, I guess Knights of the Old Republic is also, like, kind of RNG, but, like, there's not as much, like, supply, like, tracking of stuff, like, like, with Mass Effect, that's more of a, you do, you do the trick or you don't, but with more RNG splashed in because it is, in the end, a D&D system, and if you don't, if you don't roll the right the amount of, the right amount of damage, like, losing, like, time in each round is pretty, like, if you had to take an extra round to kill something, like it's very no- noticeable. Mm-hmm. So we did briefly touch on uh, Pokemon and kind of various different things with that. Uh, so we had you run uh, Mega Ruby Alpha Sapphire last year as a uh, part of a race. Um, so what is it kind of that like drew you into those games? And um, I suppose, you know, uh, how how was it uh, racing, you know, a Pokemon game on a marathon? Yeah, ironically, I typically don't really run po- Pokemon for marathons just because, like, I'm... Like, during my Pokemon runs, I just tend to be, like, very busy focusing on, like, everything, and it's a little hard to... I, I feel like you basically need a PhD to explain Pokemon mechanics <laughs> at times, and I'm just like, I, I'm sorry, I can't math. Uh, I mean, blood capacity stats, it's... 031 IVs. I like higher IVs. The end. And yeah, then if, I, if I get crit, then, uh, well, a t- tough loss. Especially because so many of the mechanics change slightly from game to game. Like, in the uh, Gen 1, I believe it's literally a coin flip whether you catch a Ratata by just throwing a Pokeball at it. But the mechanics get more complex over time. And that goes for a lot of other mechanics. And then it's like, uh, what's effective damage? Like, how, how much does stab do? What does this or the other thing do? Yeah, a lot your of po- those things have changed. Your Pokemon, mo- the Pokemon moves and like effectiveness and like what it does, like also slightly differs between each gen. So like, like for example, like after Shield, when I went to like Pokemon Black, I'm like, oh right, it's uh, the mechanics change between five. Gen 5 and Gen 8, I have to keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. To say nothing of the physical special split. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, so that's, I think, one of the more interesting things, I guess, with, like, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire specifically, because, like, that was um, the original being a Gen 3 game was before the physical special split, and then the remake was after. Yep. Granted, I think the bigger thing that affects the run with those is game giving you a free laddie yeah and then (laughs) by the time you get to the end game it's like the uh legendary is just has so many more things you can do with it if you ask the alpha sapphire run or runners uh, getting the latias is not not entirely a blessing but that's because alpha sapphire generally has like much tougher uh because they have to deal with team aqua and there's a lot more tools that Team Aqua has to basically uh, take care of Latias. Mm-hmm. So on the subject of Pokemon, I guess we should address the uh, the green dinosaur in the room, given you have a <laughs> PNG tuber model of uh, a certain Pokemon. Uh, what's the story behind the Tyranitar, if I may ask? Uh, so I, I actually don't own a webcam, so this is my... This is basically my stand-in for talking, but Tyranitar has always been one of my favorite Pokemon because I just, I, I, I unironically kind of like love like kind of like fearsome, uh, 
fearsome Pokemon. Just like <laughs> they're they're big and they they do a lot of damage and they go raw pretty much. Like I'm a big dark type connoisseur, I should say myself. I love I'm dark type Pokemon. <laughs> Yeah, so as somebody myself who periodically plays uh, Generation 3 competitive singles, um, I have to see the big green dinosaur all the time. And, like, it's funny because in the history of Pokemon, there's always been, like, a dominant Pokemon for any given metagame. In Generation 1, there was Tauros and, well, I guess the big three normals to a somewhat lesser extent. Generation 2, it was, you know, Snorlax being the best Pokemon probably for any meta ever. Uh, generations 5, 6, 7, 8 <laughs> all have Lander Asterion. But then you get to Gen 3 and to an extent 4, it's the big green dinosaur. And I think of all of the, like, you know, main competitive singles meta Pokemon. Tyranitar is like my favorite of like the dominant Pokemon. And because it's just like, it's one of the few that's like, it's so omnipresent and yet it's like really balanced. And it's kind of one of the things I love about it is it's just, it's powerful and it's potent and it can be a huge game piece, but it has enough answers that it's like, not everyone slaps on a team. You have to be smart with using it. Yeah, like it can be a physical sweeper, a mixed sweeper, a special sweeper, even, or more of a tank. Uh, yeah, and then pursuit. <laughs> I was kind mm -hmm. of like, I was kind of sad when I saw pursuit removed because I felt like it's one of the most interesting, like, combo, or not combo, one of the most interesting, like, moves that you can use to strategize with, given mm -hmm. that, like, once you send, once you send it in, if it's in on a ghost type, the ghost type has to play like this massive guessing game of whether you're going to use crunch or pursuit. You know, every every time a Tyranitar does well in a competition, the the Tyranitar <laughs> stonks go up, and Tyranitar fans are are loud and clear. It, Tyranitar is just like you, you might think it's not the greatest Pokemon because it does have a lot of weaknesses, like on the type effectiveness chart, but like it can tank those hits, especially like because Sam increases your special defense by quite a noticeable bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of one of those interesting things. I was touching on Gen 3, like Celebi is another example, because Celebi has seven weaknesses like Tyranitar, but <laughs> I mean, to be fair, half of them barely matter because fighting and bug type moves are rare and poison is just like nobody runs poison moves in that generation because it's just like why use it over something like flying or fire or anything else that hits grass a grass type but it's like it has seven weaknesses and yet it's unkillable because even the super effective moves just don't kill it you it's just, it's just you have to you have to hit it with the double weakness to make progress or else it's going to punish you hard but yeah the ability to summon sand is uh, quite underrated, especially in the eras when sand was like permanent. Mm. Um, so we also have touched on um, Octopath a bit uh, as well. Um, I believe you. Um, so you recently ran uh, was it Galdera for GDQ? Yes. Um, and we had you run the blindfolded incentive part of our any percent run for the game uh, last year. Um, so kind of. Uh, what is it about Octopath, I think, I guess, that like draws you into it? Because as somebody who has run um, a little bit of the first game, uh, I mean, I ran it partially because it was nice and quick on the single story, but you've done like full on any percent in Galdera. Uh, what is it like running those games at how long they get, I guess, with all the stuff that goes on in them? So I really liked Octopath. I ironically, I, like my first speed run, at least I submitted on SRC with Octopath. I've actually done, well, I guess like pseudo speedruns before my speedrunning career time. Before like getting to that, I played a lot of RuneScape and I've done like a lot of fast, <laughs> fast paced stuff in RuneScape. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's just funny. I played that game so long ago. I was like, I don't really think of that game in the context of fast. I think of that game in the context of you have it on, you do other things. Yeah. <laughs> 
So like, uh, I it's like like I did it for a Steam achievement because I read a plot. Mm -hmm. Like I basically kind of like watched the video and then I made my own notes out of it, and then uh, kind of like I was like, oh, I'll try out other categories, and then like I kind of kind of catapulted from there. But I really like Altipath just because it's a nice. It it has a little bit of air. Like it has really chill music. That I was gonna say that's like you, reason number two. <laughs> yeah, that, that, it's really chill music, uh, and it's just like a game. Like especially in one, it's a game where like the the menus feel like or not, I in both games are. I was I have like my mind everywhere, but it's like Octopath games are just like games where like you're you're well rewarded with great inputs just because the input. The inputs are like really well designed. Yeah, smooth menus are so underrated for RPGs. Even in the Agreed. casual context, like I remember playing my you know hundred something hour playthrough of Persona Five, and just like despite how flashy, how much animation there is in that game, a lot of the menuing in in that game is just so incredibly smooth, and it feels so satisfying that it's like. It gives you that just like little bit of, you know, a little bit of functionality that makes that, you know, extended play through that much better. So even casually, I think it's good, but it's especially nice in a speed run sense because then you feel like when your runs, you know, save time, it is a genuine skill, you know, gap between, you know, when you start running the game and when you, uh, like when you start to get better and better at it, it's kind of annoying when you have like one of those games that doesn't have very good menus and then you just make a mistake and it's just so frustrating. Yeah, it's just it's like oftentimes, you know, I was like, I pressed up twice and it only went through once. What's going on here? Yeah, after playing Pokemon, I realize that I really love speed games with like a, a gr great inputs because when I was speed running like shield, like the Mm -hmm. I, I I am not I, I am not sorry for this, but I hate speedrunning on the Switch Pro Con just because it has a real like a, a really terrible D pad and and shield and sword and shield like there's a method where you can like quickly go through menus by like kind of pressing down on a D pad as well as a stick as well and the the stick mm, on the double inputs <laughs> the, the, the stick also like it's not perfect on there also the D pad is just terrible and like i've missed input it so many times and when that happens it just does not feel good that when something that was sort of out of my control happens and at least with octopath the inputs are much more in my control and if i do something wrong i can only blame myself most of the time yeah mm -hmm. and uh, some of that menuing goes into like is it at least consistent? Because I can say things about the Final Fantasy XII menus. That's my avatar, the jelly from Final Fantasy XII, by the way. Uh, is imperfect, but consistent. So, like, you can't go as fast as I'd like through the menus, but at least the feel is consistent and, like, if you mess something up, you know why. Like, oh, I did that a little bit too fast. Uh, it's pretty easy to tell once you get that feel. And there are little things you can do, like double tapping in certain places to go one space faster, for example. And that just becomes part of the whole thing, so... Like, as long as it's well put together, that's the main thing. But in another case, like Fire Emblem Three Houses is inconsistent mostly because of lag. Mm. So, <laughs> like, that that's one of the main turnoffs for me speedrunning that game. But I still kind of want to at some point, so maybe I will. I don't know. I have heard I have heard many a Kirby Master rant <laughs> in yeah. Sanjan's Discord about about the menus and the lag in that game. Yeah, there's a lot. Like I noticed, there's a lot of like weird input lag when I watch uh, FE speed or Fire Emblem speed runs, especially like uh, Three Houses. And I'm just like, I think I would rather. Uh, I would. I think I would rather. I, I think I would rather not speed run. 
that because I would just get even more frustrated than when I do get running Pokemon and I would just instantly quit. The GameCube and Wii ones, the Tellius games, fortunately, are very smooth with their menus, especially Path of Radiance. Mm hmm. God, it'd be so nice if they would release. This part of me is like, it would be really nice if they released an HD collection, but I almost worry like if they did, the <laughs> speed run would, would probably have worse menus as a result of trying to run on something like a Switch. Maybe when the Switch 2 comes out, it would be, it would be nice to... It's nice to just start getting games off of the GameCube because of how just old and expensive they are getting. Um it's kind of one of the nice things about uh, them doing a remake of Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door coming out next month, for example. Kind of looking forward to that one. I'm interested to see how the speedrun develops for that one, but getting off track there. Um, we did mention Fire Emblem Three Houses. Um, funny enough, we actually do have a run of that in this upcoming limit mm -hmm. break. That one uh, is actually going to be, uh, as opposed to the third run of the marathon, I believe that is the like third to last run of the marathon. So it's on the gonna... last day, yeah. It's Cindered Shadows, which is the expansion. So the Cindered Shadows speedrun does not focus on beating the main game. It just focuses on beating that side story. So mm -hmm. it's a nice, quick run. You get to see some unique takes on characters where you don't quite have as much c control over them and how they're built, but they have options to work with and it's a fun run. <laughs> uh, speak of the devil. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I just I just saw a friendly face pop up in our in our limit break chat as somebody who um has dabbled as, as a friend of mine from the East community named Jado who's uh, uh, dabbled in the Switch um, Pokemon games and was kind of partially responsible for breaking one of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say, I, I love, I think the, the biggest sort, sort of fandom saga that I love following was the BDSP glitches. That, that was, that, that was a, that was a mouthful too to watch it as everything unfolded and people were just like brainstorming all the ways they could break they they broke that game and then they patched it and i was a little sad but mm -hmm. yeah it was it, I, there was definitely kind of an interesting saga going on with that one because since i want to say diamond pearl um they haven't had like a truly super glitchy pokemon game and even then, it's like, I I think they only recently found, like, the super, like, you know, arbitrary code execution stuff for uh, Gen 3. Yeah, that's uh, a, yeah. so Fire, like, Red, Leaf, Green recently. was, like, the last, gen, the last uh, Gen 3 game that they couldn't find something for. And then Glitch Hunters managed to find something there. And watching, or, like, following that was also, like, really cool, because they... It, they get like a Mr. Mime and an Abra, and then they just do like really, really wacky stuff, and then boom, they're at the Hall of Fame, and you're just like, wow. Right. <laughs> but yeah, Gen 4 was broken pretty early on because of tweaking and exploration. It was just, a, it took time for a lot of that stuff to really get put together because it involves manipulating the code in specific ways with a fairly limited tool set. Yeah, the Heart Gold run I've always found to be one of the most just like peculiar out there. It's it's one of the it's what's it's one of those categories that's actually really interesting to me and just how different the glitch versus glitchless run is because the glitched run you mainly I believe run with a manipulated uh, Raiko or um, maybe that I think that changed in recent years and then like the glitchless I think you use Tenacruel or something like that. I remember the Raikou route. I don't know the current. Yeah. The for so Heart Gold Soul Silver, or yeah, yeah, yeah it's they, so it's still, it still uses Raikou, but they mm -hmm. did implement some other tricks like uh, they manip the cans as well for Heart mm. Gold Soul Silver. Like it's a, uh, yeah. I think Heart Gold Soul Silver as like a glitchless like manip speed run is really difficult because you have to generally keep your steps very consistent. Mm hmm. Something I've always found interesting too is like the way the mains decided in in games just changes so much between 
Because like Gen 1, it's Nido King because of, I mean, Horn Drill and it just learning every dang move in the game. Gen 2, I believe you roll with the starter or um, manipulate um, something. Gen 3, um, starter into legendary. Gen 4, it's just, it depends on the game. Gen 5, like nowadays, is Stoutland. Which I think is just interesting to me, or Excadrill in black and white too. Yeah. Yeah, the fun. Get... <laughs> Sorry, I would put in with uh, Pokemon Black. Like, I think it's funny because Pokemon Black they were using Tepic for the longest time, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. a runner named Buster came in with uh, there. He was thinking, oh, I'm gonna do a uh, Little Pup as uh, Alt Me, and then they discovered that Little Pup is actually noticeably faster, with a couple tweaks. Then uh, mm-hmm. the Tepic route, and then everyone swapped to to the Stout Little Pup Stoutland route. Which, funny enough, there's some new stuff. Uh, they were finally able to manip uh, using the Dust Cloud to skip certain Plasma Trainers and 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 one in the Charge Stone Cave, which saves you like two minutes. That's something like that's really interesting <laughs> to me. Um, and like kind of on the subject of alt mains, like. That's kind of one of the things I find interesting with Pokemon is like, because it's, you know, the games have generally gotten so optimized, you know, that many people just have started to run some of their favorite Pokemon or just things that they think might be interesting to just kind of do on the side. Like, how can, how quickly can I beat this game with this, this Pokemon? It's become sort of a like hybrid between like the speed run scene and the like popular challenge run scene um, all over YouTube. It's like uh, with alt main. So just hearing that like the faster strategy came about because of like an alt main test is just interesting. Is interesting to me. I love it, and I like. I'm a big proponent of finding your own way to have fun in a speed run, and. If you like routing a speed run, that's a great way to do it. Like, route a category that hasn't been routed yet. Even if it doesn't end up becoming a main category, you could have a lot of fun and learn a lot about the game. And, like, one thing I'll say is that there is potential for a lot of different stuff in some of the Mass Effect games, especially when you take into account the fact that very few runs have been done on higher difficulties. Now, there are reasons for that, but mm-hmm. someone actually came in and did a uh, an insanity run on Mass Effect 2, I believe Legendary, not too long ago. And it's really interesting, and I'm glad it finally happened. <laughs> it's like, someone was like, why isn't there a run for this? They came in, they did it, and it's <laughs> a really interesting watch. It's kind of scuffed, as you might expect, if you've played the game. But there's so much fertile ground for you to just do new things. Just don't uh, don't get an ego about it, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people who come into speed running and like, why is nobody run this? Why is nobody run that? Can you add this to the leaderboard stuff like that? Um, but like, we need to run. <laughs> yeah, I think I would like, encourage honestly- a lot of people to be so just like just. Just try out like strats and something. Even if it's not faster, mm-hmm. like if you have oh, your yeah. own way of doing something, like. If what matters is that like you're trying to kind of like play through play through it relatively fast, and even if it's like not the fastest, like at least you try to like don't be afraid to try new things. Yeah, people sometimes have this idea that because speedrunners have spent you know hundreds, thousands of hours in various different games that we've like cracked the code on them, and that you need you need to do that for every game. And the reality is, there's a lot of games that just have untapped potential that just sometimes it takes somebody with like an idea who's like I'm gonna try this and that's all it takes to like revolutionize a game um you know anyone can route a a speed game and run it like you're even if your route probably isn't going to be anything like what it like what it's gonna be if you know somebody with a little bit more experience does it like you can still route games and run them like one of my games that was like my pet project, my very first speedrun routing project, uh, which is actually on the backup list for this limit break, it was uh, Dragon Quest Heroes The Rocket Slime. Um, nobody, like there was an old SDA thread for that game. Nobody had ever like completed a full run. 
and I had a DS capture card and I wanted to play one of my favorite childhood games and I, I routed it. I did a few runs and like the early good times are like 240 ish. And now it's under two hours because once I put in that work to get it started, other people took notice uh, whenever they looked into that game and were like, people speed run this. Why does the speed run work? I want to run that. And then they run it and they're like, you can do these little things better. And like, as somebody who had run the game a lot more, my response wasn't, oh my goodness, this newbie thinks he's, you know, outsmarting me. It's like, no, it's, it's awesome. Like seeing people come in and improve on the work that you've done and like iterate on your routes and come up with new plans. And mm-hmm. that's how that game got from my early state in 2016 of like 240 to now under two hours was just people trying things, people optimizing, coming up with new ways to like, you know, streamline movement. Uh, in the past few years, the final boss has gone from like the biggest threat to the run to the easiest thing in the game. <laughs> Yeah, and there's I have similar stories for Final Fantasy XII. I did a lot of routing for it back in the day, and I'll keep this brief just to two things. <laughs> Seven-hour game. Of, we don't have the time to talk about everything. <laughs> there, there are a lot of things I could mention, but I'm just going to mention two. One uh, was that um, the Tiamat boss fight is a physical fight. We use at least one Cypress pull. It used to be two or even three. Um, and then the... We were watching, I think it was Skate for a Living, maybe Freda do it, um, and Pitted, who um, ended up being a top runner in the game for a good while, uh, comes in and is like, is there any reason you're not using Berserk? And I was like, yeah, the money's pretty tight here. And then it was like, it's only a thousand gil. Oh crap, I didn't realize that. And it's on the same license as one that you're already getting. So... Yeah, that, that sped up the fight by a good, I think, 50 seconds. And another, the other one is that people routed a different category, which is the low-level game, where everyone is the minimum level. And one of the techniques that was implemented there over time is using a summon to clog the effect queue so that enemies can't do things as often because there's like magic and techniques and other stuff basically everything but basic attacks is in that queue so you queue up a summon and that just delays everything that comes in after and then you cancel the summon and that has revolutionized several boss fights including a couple of the worst ones hardest ones so like whether it's a new person just coming in with an idea or a new category absolutely just it's such fertile ground for finding new things that you otherwise might never have thought about hey i should say like like we get ideas from both like watching like casual people play through because some tricks have been found when people when people like were casually like just playing through the game and they just found like hey and then they just come like hey isn't this faster and then so you know sometimes we're like Oh, we know about that, but other times you're like, oh, wow, like, we didn't know that. Thank you. It's just like, everyone has their, like, everyone can kind of, like, play a role role in that. Mm-hmm. And I know, like, on speaking on, like, routing turns, it's just like, yeah, like, a lot of the, re- like, we, we all, like, especially, like, we all build on top of each other, because I can, for example, like, I I had a friend, or my, my friend 30 routed, uh, I'd see the Old Republic 2 glitchless, and then, like, a bit after, I came in and made improvements to the route, and after other people, like, some other big fans of Night's Old Republic 2, like, they came in to kind of, like, optimize on that even further. Yeah, I love that game. That That's another one, like Mass Effect 2, where I've just spent unconscionable amounts of time playing that game in high school. Yeah, like, it's kind of, I think, one of the unfortunate things in the era of Discord is that it can be sometimes hard to track down things. And so some people, it's kind of twofold. Sometimes you get people who come in and they just ask like a question that's long been answered and they just don't really know. And then you have some people who are, like, afraid to ask something because they're afraid 
that the question has already been answered and like, oh, you know, these people have hundreds of hours. They know better. And sometimes it's just worth it to ask those questions like, why not do this? And generally speaking, people, if they'll, they'll give you an answer and it's just like, as long as you're not like trying to argue in favor of something stubbornly when you like haven't tested it and haven't like and clearly don't know what you're talking about, like it, usually it's just be- like if you it, it, usually it's just better to like ask a question and see like, you know, maybe this is a possibility and kind of discuss it. And that's usually how new little things get found. And sometimes oh, yeah. it's just like the thing about speedrunners is we tend to get stuck in our ways a little bit after doing something over and over and over again and having that fresh new blood to like look at stuff. Like I watched a friend play casually a game that I had speedrun for years and years. And the way he did one of the dungeons had like just a tiny little optimization, would have saved like a second in the speedrun. But I was like watching this stream and it's just like I, I I look at this little thing he does just slightly differently. And I, I realize that's an optimization we didn't consider. How did I never think to do it this way? And, and don't also I want I want an addendum here. Don't, it don't take saying, yeah, we've known about this for ages as us talking down to you. That's just a factual statement. Ninety nine plus percent of the time. It's just saying, yeah, we know about this. We might not always say thank you, uh, but we don't always have the best tact. Um, a lot of people here aren't, like in the speedrunning community, don't have perfect social skills, but that's true for pretty much anywhere. So, like, yeah, never, don't, be, uh, <laughs> never be too discouraged no. about making suggestions just because you fear that somebody might have already had the answer to this. At best, they have the answer to it. And once in a while, somebody might be kind of rude. That's just, you know, how people sometimes act. But, you know, oftentimes I'll just say, like, yeah, we tried that. It didn't work out. And every now and then, sometimes people will have thought to try something. And you make a suggestion to do it. And they'll be like, ah, we already tried that. Sometimes somebody will go, like, you know, things have changed since we tried that. Maybe if we try it again in the current situation, things will work out like we wanted it to the first time. And I've seen sometimes that happen it too. does. Sometimes it does. Sometimes people reevaluate something because, you know, they tried it years ago and then it didn't work in the old route, but it does it does work in the new route. So Yeah. I think the best way to approach it, yeah, like sometimes like when I say, yeah, we've already tried it again, but like, thanks anyhow, just like, I think it's a thing of like talking to strangers, like you're just Kurt, 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 but like, you know, like appreciative, like, yeah, thanks for, we've seen that already though, like if you have like other suggestions or like maybe you thought of something new, like feel free to like post post a video. I think I remember one time in the Knights of the Old Republic, uh, discord like I so, felt like one of our like kind of like big glitch hunters came in and was just like oh yeah how did you or oh yeah like uh we came in with like I know you like I, I've never seen this before or like this is the first thing like hey like they contributed and then it was like consistent way to replicate something that we've had trouble replicating for so long and then like most people are like, I think we we're at first like sort of in disbelief, and then when people tried it, tried it, they're like, "Oh wow, like that was uh, that was really big. That, yeah, that's that was a really a, huge find." That was a big thing, a uh, big impetus to how uh, displaced loading zones got kind of shoved in there into the route because, like. We kind of knew they were a thing. We didn't really understand it. And then we finally got, like, a video of it. And um, then people put their heads together and figured out one place to make it work. And then next thing you know, they're, like, six or seven. (laughs) But we also did have a question. Do we want to answer that? 
Uh, I leave. The, I defer to San Jan on that one if she feels like answering it. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Oh, I see. I, I I don't like talking. Admittedly, I do not like talking about it in public that much. But I will say my favorite Emmy romance is Caden. But if you wanted a second one, uh, it's Dane. Uh, that's all I'll say on that. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Yeah, I remember you commenting about that. Mass Effect discussions sometimes can get yeah. pretty yeah. heated. Yeah, people <laughs> tend to be very heated in that discussion, and personally, it's not something I'd like to go deep into. When it comes to oh speedrun and Mass Effect, I believe in the one true romance of going fast. Yeah, uh, and for me, <laughs> just very briefly, I will say that I think Jack's romance is very touching. And... Like that had me close to tears. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's definitely something where people have strong feelings. I mean, go figure. Yeah, just be uh, kind to other people when you discuss it. Yeah, just, <laughs> just remember that other people, uh, like they come from a lot of diff like different backgrounds or like approach the game a much different way, and each way each way of approaching it is definitely okay. You know, just don't, just don't insult people for for liking something, even fandom if it's not something you like. That yeah, that, that's how that, that's how fandoms typically are. Like, Bioware fandoms are are very big into that, and just for, and I I just prefer to stay away from that. Besides it, in my speedrun canon, uh, this Shepard is is a real ace and only accepts the. The fun of going fast. As as somebody who is an East fan and speedrunner of the East series, where every game there's there's a new possible maybe kind of love interest, and the hero is just like, but I must go and venture calls. Uh, I feel you there sometimes as somebody <laughs> who loves running those games. Um, <laughs> uh, of course, of course, you have Jado and uh, Bram Hall here in the chat um, as people who've worked on East 8, which will be the opener for this year's marathon. Um, yeah, which is the main reason I'm kind of going off on this tangent. Um, yeah, I'm excited for this year's uh, limit break. We're less than a month away. Um, depending on guests, depending on um, hosts, stuff like that, this is going to be our likely second to last um you know break show before the event itself and i'm quite looking forward to it i think it's going to be probably our like it you know either this or our next break show will be the last like big kind of you know planned stream apart from maybe some sort of tournament thing during the weekdays um yeah right. how are y'all looking forward to the event this year <laughs> i i love going to rpg limit break especially because it's I can, I don't have to fly long distances. I am big on supporting <laughs> my most West Coast, mostly West Coast uh, marathons because I just Salt Lake City's close enough. <laughs> it, it's close enough. It's a for me. It's a, like a two-hour flight, and it's just real easy for me to access. And I really like the environment of RPG Limit Break, especially because like I'm big on RPGs, and it's for a cause that I think is extremely important because. I think RPGs have generally have a very good effect on people's mental health and being able to deal with the things that life throws at you. Well, well said. And I'm definitely looking forward to it as well. Um, I have to fly a bit farther, but I'm usually able to kind of work in a three-way flight uh, to also visit my mother who lives in New Mexico. So I'm doing that this time. I'm going to be down there in New Mexico eating good green chili and mm. other various things. Because, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, it's great like that. Um, I'll be leaving just before Mother's Day, but that's okay. I'll be there right before then. So that works uh, well enough. Mexico. But one of the things I'm really looking forward to is just having a the first limit break where my schedule isn't super busy 
because every single limit break before this, I've been doing all sorts of things with volunteering and such, but we got, we had enough volunteers this year um, that I don't have to do all that much. So I'm going to kind of be able to like, obviously I'll have to keep an eye on donation stuff the whole time because I'm head of donations, but I'll be able to relax a little bit more than in the past. And um, I kind of need that right now. So I'm sure it'll be a really nice kind of refreshing time for me. Yeah. As somebody who's kind of, I mean, my, my role with the staff has been kind of, it's kind of a variety of different things, but I'm going to be pretty busy this year. Um, but, you know, I'm always looking forward to just seeing people at this point. Mm-hmm. I know like probably half the people who've come to this event because I've been coming for so many years. And if you are all interested in, at all in going to RPG Limit Break, um, I definitely recommend it. Um, number one, um, registration closes tonight at 11.59 Eastern Standard Time, where, which is or actually I think we're in Eastern Daylight's time, uh, EDT, whatever. Uh, which is a little bit more than 13 hours from now. So if you're interested in going, uh, today is the last chance to actually get your registration in. Um, yeah. Hotel it's bookings Eastern. soon to follow. I think it's and 11 hours from now. Yeah. yeah. It's not the right. Sorry, I said 13. Checked. It's a little, yeah, I, I'm I'm looking uh, at it in like Pacific time. So, yeah, that, yeah. That, yeah, like, I have about 10 uh, yeah. hours. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's all time good. zones. But yeah, so a little bit of time left for that. If you haven't yet, please do. Um, it's a lot of fun to go. Um, our volunteer schedule will be releasing uh, one week from today. Uh, and hotel booking is uh, with our, you know, registration kind of code and all that uh, is going on for a few more um, a few more days as well. Um, I don't know if we're going to have time before the next show like what is two weeks from today two weeks from today will be the fifth so um if we have any more shows the next most likely one is going to be on the fifth which is the final day of our prize submissions so if you have any prizes anything like anything that you've made anything that you have you know extra that fits the marathon um go ahead and get those in um we do appreciate prizes uh, and uh, our prize donors over the years um and sometimes things that might be a little bit you know might not necessarily be our as super rpg as can still find you know a place in our um prize donations like we have two mario games this year mario is not necessarily thought of with rpg sense but if you have any like mario themed prizes that you know maybe you have lying around that you'd be interested in donating uh we do have two games that those would be very fitting for for example um i mean we have an ape escape game on this schedule so even something like that is uh you know relevant and we appreciate anyone willing to donate uh prizes um, but so that's, I guess, my my spiel there. Uh, we've gone through quite a variety of different games. Um, do either of you have any, you know, final comments you want to say? Any, any final things you'd like to offer? Um, just so we don't keep Ash in here all day. <laughs> I, I should say y'all should go to an RPG limit break. Definitely a very chill and accepting environment of great people. <laughs> we do try to... We do try to embrace, you know, variety of uh, variety and diversity with our uh, people here. And it's just, you know, very friendly vibes. So I mean, it's part of the reason why I'm staff here is I've just been going for so long and having a good time. Yeah. And I will say if um, it being in Utah worries you, uh, Salt Lake City and our venue for this year uh are generally the one area where things are a little bit more accepting. So there's room there, and it's honestly not a bad place, at least not yet. Uh, we're obviously looking into what we're going to do for the future because we want to be as inclusive as we possibly can, and we'll update you when we actually can um, in the Discord. If you're not in the Discord, uh, there should be links to it. Um, otherwise, you can search it. It's the RPG Limit Break Discord. Hop in there for any news or any things you want to do. Um, GK just linked it in chat there, I see. Um, but yeah, we'd love to have more people. Always good to hang out with fellow nerds and people who appreciate this kind of 
video gaming experience and just talk and hang out play randomizers in the practice room things like that you know <laughs> don't say that around bob <laughs> i will i'm gonna or or you do the old school randomizer which is what you which is what happens in our board game room when <laughs> yeah. four of us are playing mahjong and we're just on an east east three repeat six because the game refuses to cooperate <laughs> yeah and everyone else is on the latest horrible puzzle <laughs> and trying to figure out is this bread or is this part of the wooden structure in this kiki's delivery service puzzle oh god <laughs> oh, no. things like that <laughs> uh, for the very bit of context for any of you who weren't there for limit break 2023 uh somebody brought a puzzle themed around kiki's delivery service the old ghibli movie and <laughs> we affectionately refer to it as the bread dimension because despite it being a 1000 piece puzzle people were working on that all week and just having no luck trying to figure out where pieces go because some of the pieces yeah. were like similar size as others so they feel like they kind of fit but not really that puzzle that puzzle has gone down as like the most just terrifying <laughs> thing that we have done in the puzzle room over the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it was a thing. I spent a good amount of time on that. And I I'm I'm proud that I managed to find double digit pieces once we got into bread hell. <laughs> yeah, once you once you get the once you get the borders and you get the like name which is like a bright pink uh, everything else in that is just like it's just it, the puzzle just sucks you into another dimension. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I know at RPG Love Brave, just like doing puzzles is like the big thing everyone working together. Yeah, it's it's been sort of a tradition for the event. Um, we have our casual room, our practice room, we have the stream room, we have things people meet up and do, but in our board game room. Uh, ever since like the beginning, we've had somebody who would just bring a puzzle and it's just kind of like the collaborative nature of things is just, you know, people wandering around in some downtime. They'll go to the, you know, board game room. Oh, my God. Ashen pulled up. <laughs> oh, pulled my up goodness. <laughs> That's the puzzle. That is the puzzle. This is this is an unbelievably annoying puzzle to to get solved at the event. It's just kind of a little collaborative thing we do every year. Somebody brings like a thousand, fifteen hundred piece jigsaw puzzle, and whenever people are kind of in between things, they go to the private room and just kind of chill. There's the stream in the background, and people are just filling out a puzzle, you know, socializing. It's a very chill event, and it's kind of a vibe that we've liked to keep going, uh, except when when we're dealing with the terrors that were the bread dimension. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the, the raid bot, the true raid boss, has been defeated. <laughs> I but think we were scared that we lost a piece of that puzzle too. Yeah, <laughs> but I guess the last thing I want to say is that um, just don't be afraid to watch things that maybe you're not sure about because there's so much fun to be had discovering new things you'll you might find a game you want to play or you might find maybe a game that you think you might want to speed run like hey this looks fun even if you've never played it or haven't played it in ages um or there's a game that you didn't particularly enjoy and then you're like huh this might be a fun new way to experience this game and maybe you'll like it now i've had that experience with speed runs so be open to that as well and um also, uh, if you want to play the Mass Effect games, I highly recommend picking up the Legendary Edition on Steam. It goes on sale relatively frequently. Pick it up. It's an excellent version, uh, compatible with new hardware, and you will not regret it if you are into that kind of game at all. Bioware yeah, RPGs series, by are really good. Highly recommend playing oh, them. Yeah. Like, if not, I highly recommend Mass Effect, Dragon Age, Knights of the Republic. Like, their old RPGs are Jade incredibly Empire, good. Too. And Jade Empire. <laughs> also, Baldur's Gate one and two. Yeah, I was gonna say that's like kind of kind of the OG it was the um, the D and D games that they had. Yeah, and like you were saying, Alec, like yeah, we you know we. It, 
I'm going to post the schedule. Does this come up in there? Ah, uh, it's still the Dragon Quest RTA marathon. Uh, if you look in our Limit Break channel, um, yeah. underneath should be, be should see our upcoming events, and you can check out the schedule for this year. Check out some of the runs. Uh, you might be surprised at like the different kinds of stuff you might see if you're not as uh, familiar with some of the games. Some of my favorite marathon runs I've ever seen in the past were I was, you know, in between stuff at Limit Break and I caught something. I was on the donation station for our quest for glory one through five at Limit Break 2016, a game series before my time that I knew nothing about. And it was one of my favorite runs of the marathon. Mm -hmm. um, so with all that, um, I think we have uh, taken up plenty of your time. Uh, thank you all very much for watching. Thank you, Alec, for uh, joining me and hosting this. Thank you, Sanjan, for um, agreeing to be our guest for this week. Um, yeah. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure to talk about my favorite stuff. <laughs> it's a pretty good way to put it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so once again, uh, Limit Break, May 19th through 20, 25th slash 26th, uh, depending on time zones. Um, we There's a chance we'll have a show within two weeks, but um, unless something goes awry between now and then, uh, we will see you then uh, at the uh, main event. Um so with that, uh, we will be um, ending this show. Thank you all so much for watching, those of you on uh, YouTube, those of you on Twitch, and those of you watching the YouTube bot. Uh, thank you and take care. Yeah.